Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. All right, good morning. Um, hello to everyone who's just joining us today. Uh, well, good afternoon, rather, if you're coming from New York or a later time zone. Uh, but for me, I'm based here in San Francisco, California, so it is a solid 9.30 a.m. for me. Um, nice to meet you guys. It's nice to meet you on Zoom. Thank you for coming through. Uh, I want to thank the Office of Student Affairs for allowing me to share kind of what I've been doing here since the pandemic. And if you saw during design week, uh, if you look at the Makerspace Instagram, we kind of posted sort of a full beginning to end process for how to make a long board. And we made one that was about like four, 4.2 feet long. Uh, so if you want to see that, just go for, or look for the Makerspace Instagram account, and then they will be able to like, they have the video link there, I think in their bio. Um, but thank you for joining me today. Uh, this is going to be an interesting format because I'm not used to teaching woodworking or explaining woodworking in any capacity um, other than in person. So this is going to be very interesting. Um, I am kind of a bit of like a nature gal, so it's somewhat rooted in sustainability. So I'll bring those up uh, as we go. But thank you guys for joining me today. So for the, today's agenda, I wanted to talk about a few different um, a few different kind of aspects that we can touch on in relation to woodworking. Uh, hello to everyone who's just joining. So I wanted to talk briefly about woodworking in pop culture, uh, and then I'm going to lead into an overview about what I do and what is happening in this photo here on the left. And kind of the bulk of this is going to be a little bit technical, um, but I do want, because this is in a Zoom session, to as much as possible explain kind of broader what this process looks like. So that's why I want to talk about getting started in woodworking. I think I have a few slides that include some of my recommendations about getting into this as a hobby or even as a side hustle. Uh, and then we can go into discussions, questions, and answers. And then last but not least, we will go into a deck raffle uh, because I have made a couple boards that I'm going to show a photo of later. And if you've seen it, um, on my garage Instagram, it's two, or well, I'm, I'm keeping one for myself. So the ones that I made in this video, but the one I'm gonna raffle off is basically 120%, like a scaled up version of a penny board. Uh, so we'll go through that. I'll introduce myself very briefly. My name is Isabella Asenas, but I, at school, I mostly go by Isai. Uh, I'm a senior in environmental studies. So I am actually a student at CAS, but at Tandon, I am taking a couple different uh, design thinking courses, uh, mainly through uh, recommendations of Enlor Fayard, who is a, she's the faculty mentor for Design for America. So if you've seen them in the makerspace, you've seen Dr. Fayard, and she is kind of my go-to for all things Tandon and all things makerspace. Uh, so throughout my time at NYU, because I'm a senior now and I'm on my way out, my research over the years has really centered around environmentalism. Uh, so I focused on rice agriculture. I did field work in the Philippines. Uh, while I studied abroad in Sydney, I did uh, research about invasive marine species. And in Abu Dhabi, I spent my time in a computer lab just focusing on sea level rise models. And so my NYU experience has very much been focused on environmentalism, that research side, gaining those technical skills and that. Uh, but another important aspect of me that I do tend to mention in like first or second conversations is that I was raised in a mechanics shop. So both of my parents are mechanics and they, the story is that I was born on a Friday and then that following Monday, I was, they brought me to the shop. So almost since day one, I have been surrounded by tools, uh, you know, power tools, regular tools, been surrounded by car parts, tires, things like that. So it's been quite the journey. And I'd say that because of this woodworking kind of aspect of my life, I was really predisposed to taking this on as a hobby because it's really not that far off given the skills that I've learned. Um, I also took auto shop classes in high school through the local community college. Um, so if anything, woodworking was 
actually kind of a lot easier for me because I had those technical skills in hand. But I included a screenshot if you wanted to see my garage account here I post uh, a lot of the work I do it's honestly it's really difficult to document projects because you have to set up a camera and I have like a really kind of I, I don't know how to describe it it's not a professional setup but it's something that just holds my GoPro like this um, but I'll also include photos from some of the wood shop classes that I teach and that kind of gives an insight into what I'm doing when I'm not in class. Ooh, so I wanted to start off with talking about a bit of woodworking in pop culture. I thought this would be interesting because um, what I've seen in pop culture has kind of influenced the way that I personally have approached woodworking. Like I mentioned before, I have this kind of family background that's very you know, rooted in using tools and mechanics and a lot of those quite literally motor skills. Um, but watching these TV shows growing up and being surrounded by kind of a lot of the trades growing up, uh, that did kind of influence maybe how I saw myself in this sphere. So on the upper right hand corner, I, I have a little screenshot of what I feel like is like the pinnacle of what I envision when woodworking. Uh, so it's like some kind of 80s style photo. There's some like filter there. Um, and it's like a dude with a beard wearing plaid who's like putting finish on, on a table. Like for me, that's just um, kind of peak woodworking. And on the left-hand side, I included the show Home Improvement. It aired from uh, 1991 to 99 uh, when I was born. And I did watch a little bit of this growing up, but I knew that the concept was like, a family sitcom, but the premise was that they had a TV show within this show. So these two guys here, uh, they were sharing sort of their carpentry experience. Um, and the whole premise was like teaching people how to do home improvement projects in their home and teaching them the skills and the tools that they were using. Um, so that kind of reminds me of the way that I work with youth today to teach them what they could do with, with a drill or with a jigsaw. A reference that is a bit more recent is Parks and Recreation. I went from 2009 to 2015, but I didn't start watching this until all of the seasons came out on Netflix. And this is a mockumentary sitcom. And a lot of the characters are so interesting because they're like, they're almost like caricatures of supposedly how they are in real life. Um, but one character is Ron Swanson, and he is known to, you know, he's like an environmentalist at heart, you know, he's someone who kind of acts in solitude, but another big component of his personality is the fact that he does woodworking. Um, and so he has a high emphasis on craftsmanship, and it is somewhat tied to his affinity to nature, uh, though it's not that explicit. And so I think I kind of see myself in his character, where I'm super passionate about the environment uh, but also the craftsmanship that comes with woodworking. So I'd say that these influences really shaped what I thought was possible within woodworking. Uh, suddenly it wasn't just about like putting an Ikea table together or just building a chair. Suddenly it's the whole attitude around it. It's saying, this is what I have in front of me. These are the materials that I can use and the tools that I can use. And I can essentially do anything with them. I can do anything from building the own, my own cabinets in my own home uh, to building a canoe or building, in my case, a longboard. And so that brings us to Issa's garage. And this is a, a 15 by roughly 15 by 15 feet corner of the mechanic shop that my parents work in. So in this photo, I'm teaching. So I would take in students in groups of about uh, two to three. And so this is like a brother and sister duo in the back and then one girl here who I'm uh, working with to teach how to use a jigsaw. And I would start these lessons right at 4 p.m. when the whole shop closed. So by that time, you know, it's on an industrial road in San Francisco. Everyone's gone home for the day and suddenly we have a few minivans come in uh, with families who are trying to learn how to do woodworking. So we'd set up shop in our little corner and I have everything that you need. I'm usually setting up like about an hour beforehand uh, just to make sure they have everything they need. 
I started this because it actually is rooted in kind of my family background in skating. So my brother is about a decade older than me and he's been skating his entire life. So naturally when I was born or when I could walk or when I could run and ride a bike, um, the next step naturally is learning how to ride a skateboard. So he taught me how to do that. Uh, we kind of grew an affinity for longboarding in particular just because it was very smooth, it was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, we at the time we were living in the suburbs, so there were a lot of like kind of wide corners to take and cool places for us to go. So that background in skating really inspired the woodworking. So if you can see in the photo, there's like those kind of back panels, there's like a blue one and a gray one. And hanging right in between them, you can see the grip tape of it, but there's a long board that's there. And that's the very first deck that I ever rode. So that's like seven, eight year old me can barely like form a sentence possibly just trying to figure out how I'm gonna ride this like three foot long deck. Um, so I've always been exposed to like the, the dimensions of the board, what it's like to skate, what I wanna see in a long board. So that inspired the woodworking aspect of it because instead of riding and riding and breaking boards and then having to buy new ones, I was thinking, if I have all these tools here, if my parents do what they do, I can just make this myself. So that's when I was like, okay, I'm just gonna get a bunch of plywood, about a fourth of an inch thick, glue them together, jigsaw them out, and I can make them the shape I want. I can mold it the way I want. So really it was that foundation in skating and being comfortable with it and knowing how to critique what I want in a board it's the reason why I've been able to do this. And I also kind of came out of desperation because the idea of having to buy different decks, especially if you want them different shapes or different concavities, that's, uh, that's very expensive. So ultimately this was the moves. And now I teach teenagers to basically do the exact same thing, which has been so much fun. I have two different approaches when it comes to making boards. Uh, so first, I'll say this. So for skateboards, I don't make those because that requires very specific dimensions. And you're typically using veneer that is super flexible. You know, that's wood that's so thin that it can be rolled up into, um, it can just be rolled up and, and stored away. And you have to use like different kind of cross layers for that. So skateboarding is very, it's regulated. There's very specific dimensions, materials, and a process for them. Uh, so I really don't have much flexibility when it comes to making skateboards, but with long boards, as you've seen, if anyone has seen on like their Instagram explore page, for example, there's people who are using long boards of all different kinds. Uh, there's a group out here, I think based in Santa Cruz that focuses just on downhill longboarding. Uh, so that requires specific wheels, specific trucks, and they're not using something that's like crazy long. Whereas if you've seen videos of people cruising by the beach, for example, that is very focused on, that's like just about cruising. They're not turning all too much so they can use like a five foot long board. So there's a lot of, a lot more flexibility when it comes to long boarding. And so we start off with the wood and there's two different processes that I take on. Uh, the first being, and if you see, saw my design week video, this is the video that I actually put in that. Uh, and, and this is, what is this one? Oh yeah. These are the different plywood uh, layers that I'm using. So these are a fourth of an inch thick and I'm using type on or Loctite glue uh, to glue each layer together and just basically sandwich them. And so once I've gl like glued all those layers together, uh, because it's flexible, you can kind of shift it however you like. I'm using a baseboard uh, here on the left along with smaller pieces of wood and positioning them under this panel that I've essentially glued together uh, to bend the board how I want to. And so I probably should make the full video, but here in at the nose and at the tail of the board, that's how I'm gonna make, con I'm gonna make it concave uh, from nose to tail. Uh, but also too, sometimes I'll put small pieces of wood on the sides. So it, it's almost gonna be like a bowl and so that concavity is really important because it allows, for me personally, it's more comfortable to ride a board that's concave. And I say that because, you know, even growing up when I was learning to ride, my feet would naturally shift on the board. So if I were to like pump with my right foot 
and lead with my left foot. I don't know if it has to do with me being left-handed, but, um, but through that process, my feet would shift on the deck. And that happens. Like sometimes you're turning a corner, you put place your foot back on the board and you're not sure like where you ended up, but you're also not like looking down at the board the whole time that you're riding. So the board being concave for me and for a lot of other riders and what I recommend for the youth that I teach is to make it concave so that you can feel where your feet are on the board. So in, in case that, you know, you, you pump with like your right foot or your left foot and you end up with your feet back on the board, you can tell, oh man, I'm kind of nearing the edge. I should put my feet back to where it's lowest on the board. So it's very comfortable um, and it kind of takes, again, kind of riding experience to really know how to get what you want out of uh, making a deck for yourself. So there's that process, there's making it from uh, thin pieces of plywood, and then there's also just making it kind of from a slab. And so this is where the upcycling of lumber comes in, because we'll have lumber come in from like Golden Gate Park, for example, or from a park in Palo Alto or Menlo Park. And these slabs will come in and I'll put them through a planer and they're gonna come out a very specific, uh, specific width or specific thickness rather. And I'm gonna just have to work with it. And there's not, there's no gluing. I can't really mold it that much. So what I do is I would just first cut out the deck shape that I want. And do I even include any, a little bit. So I clamp it down, use the jigsaw, cut out that whole template. And if I want concavity, I'm gonna actually sand it by hand. So using just a classic hand like orbital sander, I'm just gonna start sanding down the middle and hope that it kind of creates somewhat of like a bowl. Uh, for the design week video, that one I, I didn't have, I didn't make it concave in that, uh, but for other boards that I've made, I've just had to do that on my own. Ooh, designing the deck, This I think this part is the most fun, honestly, because there's so many, so many different designs, so many ways you can take this. A long time ago, there used to be this website and I had to look through like archives, like through five different Reddit, Reddit posts just to find this. But there used to be this archive of, um, of longboard templates that you could actually print out. And so these are all the Churchill templates like merged into kind of one graphic. And so you have everything from kind of the traditional like pintail to these ones that are like the double drop and these ones that are almost merging of the two. And you know, you have a few different outliers and some of these kind of model, if you've seen like any skeleton boards today where the, there's parts of the board that are like actually kind of hollowed out so you can like grab onto them like handles uh, and it also helps make the board a bit lighter. And using Adobe, just like Adobe PDF Reader, there's an option for you to print something and, and basically blow it up uh, to scale. And using these templates, you don't even have to use exactly what ends up being printed out. Because for example, if I want to swap these ends, I can do that. Something I've done even with just this template in particular on the right is that I've shortened the board. So this part is just completely straight. So I'll just cut off that little strip in the middle and uh, shorten the board to how I like. So there's that, there's using the templates and there's, then there's also just kind of doing it by hand slash designing your own. The photo on the left is the three boys that I had come in about a few months ago. Uh, they're all in middle school and they had very specific ideas for their boards. So Dylan and Gus wanted something that was like a classic pintail with a bit of a kick flip at the end. Uh, but Giovanni wanted something, he, he kind of wanted to do his own thing, uh, which is great. And I was trying to figure out how to pull that off. So I just pulled up AutoCAD and I was like, okay, let's start with, start with a rectangle. Uh, let's just try out these different shapes. It's gonna help me see how much I have to cut out um, and so we were just working with like different circles and he was like, oh, I want it like hollowed out here on the, like curved in on the sides and also kind of near the top. But I also wanted to, you know, have handles essentially drilled in on the sides. And so this was essentially something that we created <laughs> based off of this very poorly hand-drawn uh, concept. For the board that I'm raffling off in this session, 
so that's what it looks like. That's the scaled up uh, penny board. And so I did base it off of a template and I just scaled it up on Adobe. And here I'm using one cedar slab to create two of these decks. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this Ryobi jigsaw uh, to cut it out and also split that wooden, that cedar slab into two so that it's just easier to work with. So I, this is the tool that I use. It's a corded version of the Ryobi jigsaw. There's a lot of tools out there that have the corded version, like, you know, having the electrical cord and some that are battery powered. So you don't have to get like, you know, you don't have to drag around a cord, but that's very, it's very expensive. It could almost be a difference of about a hundred dollars, uh, which is kind of nuts. So I just use the corded version. I just bring an extension cord and drag it around with me. Um, but I essentially, I just kind of make it work. So after I draw out those templates, I'm going to clamp it down, position it between these two tables. And the thing about the jigsaw is that it does allow you to do different, to take curves kind of left and right, uh, but it's not, it's not as easy as you might think it might be. Uh, I definitely thought I could make sharp turns really quickly, but it's totally not the case. You have to make actually very wide turns. And by making wide turns, you're actually able to, uh, you know, make the sides a bit smoother. So you have to do it very strategically. So as you can see, my focus isn't splitting the board right down the middle. I'm actually kind of trying to split it by cutting into the template already. So I just do that to minimize the number of cuts that I have to make and just makes it a bit easier. So as you can see, I go in from the middle and I already start cutting out the one that I've drawn on the left side. And I set that one aside, set up the next one. And with the same thing, I started off here at, or you can't see it. I started off here at this end because that's where I'd cut before. So minimizing the number of like entrance cuts that I have to make into the wood, it's just, it's easier for you. You spend less time, you know, worrying about cutting this section and this section and this section. If you can strategize and have a good eye for it, you can do this in as few cuts as possible. And that's basically my strategy with what I'm doing here. And this brown part here on the edge, uh, we call that live edge. And that essentially means that it's it's not the bark itself, but it comes in between the bark and the, the core of like the wood. And we like to keep kind of that live edge on because it gives it a bit of character. And it also is just a, you know, a bit of a conversation piece about it. It's proof that it comes from these trees that are falling from San Francisco uh, and the Bay Area at large. So I like to keep those sides in. So I'm cutting out the second one. And once I have these two rough cuts out, uh, I'm gonna route the edges. And this is the tool that I use. Actually, no, I don't use the Milwaukee. I use, <laughs> I probably use some like version that I found online, but it does the job really well. This is basically the same size as this one. As you can see, it's like a handheld device. It almost looks like uh, one of those like blenders, one of those like cup, one cup blenders. Um, but it weighs about that much, I'll say. When you buy one of these, it's gonna come with different bits at the end. So it's like a drill bit, like, you know, sometimes you want a drill bit that's super thin or you want a drill bit that's like huge if you're trying to like put a really thick bolt through it. Um, but this one will come with, uh, with different bits at the end. And essentially what it's gonna do is gonna, it's gonna take the edge of wood, which is like, you know, like a 90 degree edge. And you can do multiple things with it. You can either kind of cut perpendicular to it, uh, kind of shave off the sides. I use this for rounding off the edges. And so I like when the boards kind of have rounded off edges, they're easier to grab. Uh, they're just more comfortable to hold and it's, you know, it's not gonna cut you once you've like sanded it down and it feels nice. So using that rounded off bit, you know, plug it in because I have the corded version of these tools. 
going to start making my way from left. So that's the rounded bit. I'm going to start working my way from left to right. So that's the only direction that you can use a router because you have to go with the grain of the wood. And so I'm starting to make my way around. If you notice, I actually have to flip it over because you have two sets of those edges, right? When you have a board that's this thick. So you have to round it or you have to route it, flip it, route it again. And so it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see that it's rounded off. And we do that so that by the time that we sand it, you don't have to focus or spend so much time on shaving down or rounding out those edges by hand. So at this point, I'm using an orbital sander. And the camera is shaking because it's a very loud and very powerful device. And working with the edges that I rounded off, I'm gonna kind of shape the board the way I want to. And this is the orbital sander that I use. These two sanding disks here, uh, for anyone that is engaged with uh, sanding in the past for personal projects or anything of that matter, or home improvement, for example, these different sanding disks attach as Velcro to the tool. And they're gonna have different grits on them, which essentially mean that you know, one's gonna be rougher, one's gonna be a bit smoother. What you do is you work from the lowest grit to the highest grit. So probably the one that I'm using in this video is 40 grit, meaning it's super rough. Like you can look at it and tell that it's sandpaper basically. And that's gonna cut the deepest when you put it on this orbital sander that I'm using. And when you start working your way up the grit, the, it's gonna get finer and finer and the, that disc is gonna get smoother and smoother. So you have to switch them out. So when I start with the 40, maybe I'll jump after it to an 80 and it's going to start, the sanding is going to get finer and finer, smoother and smoother to the point where it just feels like butter by the time you're touching it. Uh, and usually hit that after you sand at about 180 grit or I've gone up to even 320. There's even grit at 600, but it's kind of pointless at that point. Um, so if you can kind of see closely, it's a bit tough, but I'm trying to like even out the edges. It looks a little bit lopsided. I'm um, trying to match it with the template, hope that it, I, I can kind of salvage this and make it look somewhat symmetrical. And so that's my focus with, um, with this section. For the photo that was here, I was basically just using classic grip tape. So I had attached a photo of one of my students who actually made that board that came from like the AutoCAD uh, template that I showed earlier. And that was just classic grip tape. So you peel the backing, it's like one big sticker. We put it on, it's kind of a, you know, a team, it requires a team of two. And a lot of people use an X-Acto knife to cut around the edges. Uh, but normally what I'll just do, and I have my students do, is I just use like classic school supply scissors, like the kind you use in elementary school cut around the edges as close as you can to the edge of the board. And what we do is we actually sand the edges down. And so it disintegrates the grip tape and it makes it like the edge looks super clean uh, because you've essentially sanded down away the grit. And so it doesn't look super like, this is where the grip tape ends and where the edge of the board begins. But in the design week video, that was grip tape that I had made from sand from the beach. Uh, it, it was actually my dad's idea. And I was like, oh, you're crazy. And then it worked and I was like, oh yeah, you're not crazy. So then that's what we did. I would use epoxy or wood glue, let it dry for a little bit. I don't wanna put it when it's still like freshly put on the board. And I would literally just dump sand on top, spread it out, try and cover the edges as much as possible might have to do maybe two or three iterations of this to really make sure every spot is covered. And so it's not perfect, but that's what you end up with. And it feels like grip tape. Like I've never had any issue with it. Uh, so it's almost actually cost effective for me to just make this grip tape than to buy like a $7 sheet of like four feet of classic grip tape. But for the students, I typically just buy grip tape because I'm not I don't know. It's it's a lot of work to 
do the self-made version of grip tape and also it's just safer for them if they use like industry standard um, equipment. Okay, hardware. Uh, yeah, I, I included this video. I usually, depending on the age of the student that comes in, I might do this beforehand, but if they're old enough, usually I'll have them do this process. And if you've seen any videos on it, you know, it's the, it's the washer and then the bearing, but then you have to like sandwich the bearing with a spacer in between in each wheel. And so sometimes that process can be overwhelming for a 12 year old. So usually we'll just do it together or I'll do the hard parts and then, you know, they'll come in with like the hammer and just uh, put the, the bearings and spacers into place themselves. So we're gonna put them, we would put them in together. Uh, I would just get these shipments in from Ontario, California. That's where I get all of my hardware and they supply wheels of all different colors, you know, trucks in silver and black as well. Uh, so they've been really helpful in making sure that, you know, these youngins can get the board that they're really dreaming about. When I, I don't think I included a slide for drilling into the board. When you drill the four holes, uh, those have to be super precise. So if anything, that's something that I might even spend the most time on when, uh, when someone comes in to make a board with me. Uh, and I'll do this beforehand. I'll use these spacers here, uh, which as you can see on this side, help you know, quite literally give space between the trucks, the wheels and the deck. And this helps when, especially when you're turning, because uh, there's this thing called wheel bite, uh, where the, you know, you'll, it'll break you, like, it'll break the board, as in B-R-A-K-E, uh, when the wheel hits the deck. So the spacers give it, gives it space, uh, so that you're not, every time you, like, turn on the board, you're not, like, risking your life or anything. So I would use these spacers to help measure out where I have to drill the holes. Uh, so you're typically using like the inner foremost. These ones on the outside are optional. Sometimes I have uh, people who also drill those two in, but I'm just focused on these ones. Um, and they match up, of course, with the trucks that I have here. And this is what I end up with. I thought about finishing both boards completely in time for this session, but I was thinking because of the nature of Zoom and some of the other topics I wanted to get across, I actually wanted to stop here in terms of making the board. At this point, they're pretty much completely sanded down. So I went from the 40 grit to the 80 grit to I think, what was it the 150? And then I stopped at 180. So four iterations of sanding, smooth as butter. Uh, good luck to anyone who's gonna get this one. And I think, I don't know if I'm gonna raffle off the one or the top or the bottom, but they're basically identical. I wanted to stop here in terms of making these boards um, because I was thinking that if I was gonna give this to one of you, if you're artistic in any sense, you might wanna paint on it, maybe take it to the maker space and use like a laser cutter to put some pattern in it yourself. So I was thinking, okay, maybe I'll just stop here and whoever gets this, we can work together. Um, and I, I could finish it here for you before sending it off. But I just want to give that kind of creative freedom before I do that. So that's what they look like right now. As an overview of the garage itself, it is very cluttered, but it has everything that you need. So the space itself has work tables, as you can see, the shop stools, shelves where I keep all the tools so that you know, especially if younger people are coming in, they don't have to like dig around through things. And that's kind of um, a safety concern. But if they can see it all on a shelf and they go, uh, Miss Isai, I need that jigsaw right there. I can go and get it for them. And of course, milk crates, uh, you can't have too many milk crates in a warehouse. That's just perfect for carrying tools. And if I'm separating, especially when I separate them by work tables, uh, I'll just put a milk crate on each table and like throw what they need for that day into the milk crate. So it's like safety glasses for you, safety glasses for you, gloves for you, gloves for you, things like that. Uh, for the tools that I have, as you saw, I'm using, well, I have one Ryobi jigsaw, but I also have three that are like, I think like the Walmart store brand, still great, but uh, just not as robust. Uh, but I use those with my students. Sanders, an orbital sander, 
most recently invested into a belt sander, uh, which is, you know, stationary, like bench top type of tool. Uh, so I'm using that to, you know, help sand out some edges. Got a circular saw, got the router, like I showed you, the one that looks like a little hand blender. And of course I have drills because how else am I gonna stick the hardware to the deck itself? In terms of safety, which is especially an added concern uh, with COVID, but in general, woodworking is not a hobby that I would just recommend for anyone to start if they don't have those safety precautions in place. Uh, so N95 masks are useful, not just for COVID safety, but also for the sake of like fine wood dust, like not getting into your respiratory system. And so we have that in addition to safety glasses, clamps to hold all the boards down, anything that we're cutting, it's super dangerous to cut without clamping down your material uh, because the blade can even pick up the, like quite literally pick up the wood that you're trying to cut into. Uh, and it's just very dangerous at that point, clamp it down. Uh, ventilation and vacuum hoses, that's more about the shop in general, uh, but because of the nature of this shop and being a mechanic shop, we already got that in place. I wanted to cover a few of these questions. I've gotten these from like 10 year olds. I've gotten these questions from parents as well. So I thought I'd include them here. What is it like to do woodworking on an almost daily basis? It is way harder than it looks. Uh, even as someone who is predisposed to picking up woodworking naturally because of my parents, you're, you're gonna find obstacles and you're gonna hit obstacles that you didn't think you'd expect. So it seems simple, cut, sand, finish, um, but there's gonna be something that throws you off. Either it's gonna be the angle at which you cut or it's gonna be the grit of the sandpaper or the handheld orbital sander is not robust enough. So you're gonna have to invest in like a $300 Canadian brand sander. Uh, so that's gonna be, there's so many considerations to make along the way that you don't realize until you start getting into it. Some people ask about what kind of projects they can make if they wanted to get started in, work, in woodworking. And really just, it just comes down to starting somewhere. I recommend sticking with one type of project, getting really good at it, and then just moving on. Um, I don't recommend spreading yourself out thin and just building a bunch of things one time uh, because you're gonna come in, you're gonna come face to face with all these obstacles, these minute obstacles that I briefly touched on earlier. It's best to just kind of learn as many skills around that project as you can. So that might mean like building five stools or building two tables uh, to really, you know, get in your head. For me, starting with boards allowed me to move on to projects that are more complex, uh, especially in terms of planning, like tables and planters, for example. For tools that are best to start with, refer to the size of your space. Uh, if you look at woodworking channels, like on YouTube, for example, they're going to be like, oh, it's so easy to just make this table. And then they have like like a table saw. Like most people don't have a table saw on hand. And if you do, it's because you have the space for it and you use it enough for it to be useful for you. Refer to the size of your space. First and foremost, start with safety equipment uh, and an orbital sander, a jigsaw, and then move on and invest into bench tools. Uh, and that's what I mean, like the tabletop ones that are more robust. I wanted to bring these guys up because they've been supplying all of my upcycled wood. Uh, they're Arbor Upcycle and they intercept trees from landfills and turn them into new projects uh, from furniture to charcuterie boards. A lot of it is furniture. So like tables, shelves, things like that. Super popular, especially here in the Bay Area. When not making long boards, I am helping that, I'm helping Arbor Upcycle make charcuterie boards. This has been a lot of fun. So they come to me in slabs like this. This is what, you know, also they look like before I turn them into long boards, but I'll cut them out using that Ryobi jigsaw that you saw earlier. Uh, so they're gonna look super rough like this. And then I'll make them in batches of like 30, which takes a, takes a while. It, it'll take me like a, maybe a week and a half to get like a work order like this in. You can see the edges are rounded off because I use the router. 
I'm sanding them. And right now these, I, I did a process of wet sanding because if you actually wet the board, uh, the higher the grit you go, the water actually brings out the fibers. And so it helps you, like once you sand again after that, get it even smoother than before. And this is kind of what it looks like at the end. And this is made out of walnut from Golden Gate Park tennis courts. So all of these boards have like a really interesting story behind them in terms of the trees that they came from. And so it's a really interesting talking point for me, um, especially when I'm using that same wood to create decks. Otherwise, if I'm using plywood, it's just like a two by four panel from Home Depot. So it's not that interesting. Uh, another project that came from quarantine, this is a collaboration between me and my dad. We wanted to build an entire camper trailer. So my family very much loves the outdoors and we have invested in a proper like camper trailer before that's about a teardrop shape um, and but it is not homemade so we were like let's just make one ourselves this is what it looked like kind of when we first started we wanted to make it sort of like a hex shape so i put that through autocad also drafted up what that could look like there and now this is what it looks like so this is the whole this is the whole thing uh you can sleep in it, There's, it fits two people, it can hold bikes, as you can see, it can hold my long boards up here. Uh, so that's been a really fun process. So let's see, do I have after, oh, okay. Discussions slash questions slash answers. I'm gonna merge these last two, cause I'm actually gonna try and wrap up here uh, cause it's kind of been a while. So I was thinking about this, probably just go, because I don't want to imply that everyone in this session necessarily wants this deck. Uh, so in like the next two minutes, just go to this URL and it should be open even if you don't have like an NYU account, but we are asked, but I'm asking to put your net ID just so I can cross reference with it. It's just that, so you don't have complications with signing in. So go to this URL, um, but as we do that, let me put that in the chat too. No, I don't know how to do that. We'll start there. But as y'all do that, I think it's also a good time to jump into any discussions slash questions that you might have about um, making boards, the space itself, getting involved in different projects and whatnot. So now I'll open it up, but also, you know, if you want the deck, fill this out as we do that. And then I'm thinking probably like right after the session ends, I'm going to throw everyone through like a random generator for your net IDs. And then I'll email you like two minutes after the session ends. Uh, hey, I have a question. Um, so once you've gone all through that process of, you know, finding and having your board ready, you get to the artwork. Uh, what have you found to be the best process of getting art onto a board? Oh, great question, Mike. Uh, it's so much fun because like, you know, I have a bunch of middle schoolers who will come in and say that they want an American flag with a fighter pilot, like right in the middle. I'm like, how are we gonna, I don't know how we're gonna even logistically do that because, you know, the given the kind of art skills that both he and I have, it's, uh, we're trying to figure out how to do that. I've used virtually every type of medium to, uh, to put art on the bottom of this board or not this board, but just boards in general. So I don't know if I have a photo of it, but I have one deck and oh it's on my it's on my Instagram account it's isas underscore garage and I have one that I specifically did like marbling with uh, or a marble acrylic pour and that was just basically thinning out acrylic paint uh, the solution almost just looks like milk so we put the pigments in marble it together so it kind of just looks like one big like abstract piece 
And so that was really useful. And that was something that I recommended from that point on, uh, just thinning out your paint, especially if you want colors to merge together, or even if you just want a solid color, thinning it out with acrylic thinner. I think that's what it's called uh, because it keeps it even. Uh, it also keeps the layers very thin. What's tough with like painting directly on the board is that you'll naturally kind of have these clumps of paint that are bound to happen. Uh, and it's not very noticeable if you like paint a wall in your house, but if you're painting it on your board, you're probably gonna notice it. So I recommend kind of thinning it out in that sense. Um, I've also done like hydro dipping. Uh, so I, I would just like spray paint or just put, yeah, mainly spray paint also kind of in a marble uh, design in just like a tub of water dunk the thing in and then it's going to come out with like what it, what exactly I pressed it down in. So you can see hydro dipping uh, videos on YouTube and that's essentially uh, what I've tried before. So there's painting directly on it uh, using acrylic paint, spray paint. Uh, I'm in the process of using a friend's laser cutter to try and, you know, put some custom engraving into this, uh, which is something that I can help anyone do if anyone's interested in it. And I'm trying to think what else. Sometimes we've just put stickers on the bottom of the board and layered the whole thing with like a resin at the end just to seal it. So that'll like resin slash epoxy is almost just like adding a layer of plastic over it. So you're not gonna feel the ridges of the sticker. Uh, so I've done that before and for people who have just wanted to put like, like a sports team logo on the bottom of their board, for example. I think that's it. Yeah, that's all I can think of for now. Gotcha, thank you for your insight. For sure, for sure. All right, are there any other questions before we wrap up and I'll give any final notes? Hi. Hi V, how's it going? Uh, going okay I guess kind of cold um but I just had a question I guess on the same note of like sealing the board like if even if you don't put like an art or a sticker um design on the board do you still seal it with like resin or epoxy or is it fine if you I guess kind of just leave it raw mm. so given the nature of my writing style I personally I'm bound to totally ruin the bottom of the board so my thinking is like oh man I don't want to ruin the art that I just like put on there. So my go-to personally is sealing it uh, with a thin layer of resin only because it's um, it's a really robust process. But if you were to keep it, for example, uh, just the wood and just wanted to seal it like that, for example, uh, I would use the same process. Yeah, I would use the same process as you would for like finishing a piece of furniture. So that typically looks like a layer of like polyurethane, uh, which is commonly known to uh, seal furniture, for example. And it gives, it gives it a seal while also like highlighting the grain. So it also works as like kind of a wood stainer. Um, but you're right, it does depend on the type of art that you do put on the bottom of the board. I've had a couple of people who just wanted the art and actually didn't want to seal it for whatever reason. Maybe they wanted to work on it later. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways of, uh, ceiling art. Okay, thank you. Sure, for sure. Okay. Any last ones before I wrap up? Um, <laughs> uh, where does a guy in New York City find wood slaps, you know, to do their own project? Ooh, okay. Mind you, I haven't been in New York in a while because I was studying abroad like for a whole year before COVID, so I haven't like by the time I was doing this consistently, like since the pandemic, since being home, I, I'm not sure how to replicate in New York. I think, okay, so finding wood slabs, I'm able to access these because of like the wood milling shop that focuses specifically on intercepting these trees before they go to the landfill. And these come from like the arborists. This is like a, partner company to an urban forestry company. So I'm sure there's or urban forestry companies within New York City that similar to San Francisco right here, uh, focus on 
like maintaining these trees, sometimes cutting them down for safety reasons, for example. Uh, but I'll look into it. I'd say um, probably if there's a way, if you could shoot me an email, I would look into this and I'm gonna ask around to see. Uh, so my email is, I don't know how to access the chat from here. Oh, here, I think. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, perfect. I'm just gonna put my email here. I'd say Mike, shoot me an email because uh, I'll, I'll look into this for you. It's just my last name at nyu.edu, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, totally. Thank you so much. I will shoot you up. Of course, of course. And listen to, to anyone that's here and if you guys know anyone who is interested in doing like woodworking in general, but especially working or trying to make your own decks yourself, uh, just hit me up because what I've shown, and I'll kind of close up now with this, what I've shown in this presentation, um, I'll just stop the share. What I've shown in this presentation is a broad overview of like the million things that could really happen in this sphere. So I, I have a few different types of projects going on here, like the charcuterie boards, but also teaching kids longboarding or teaching kids how to make longboards rather. Um, but luckily I've been able to gain knowledge in a lot of the intricacies of not just writing, but making them. Uh, I'm still trying to learn because I'm not a super artistic person. I'm still trying to tap into that side of my brain. Um, I'm still learning about kind of artistic expression and ways that you can like seal artwork kind of like what V mentioned um, or even just making new decks that has been there's a lot more essentially what I'm saying is there's a lot more where this came from so please don't feel please don't hesitate to shoot me an email uh, or just you can hit me up on Instagram through my garage account uh, because through there I'm also trying to keep everyone updated on different things I'm working on and things I could possibly help people do. So that being said, thank you guys so much for attending this. This was a lot of fun. Uh, in terms of the raffle, like I mentioned, I'm just going to go through the net IDs, throw it through a random generator, and I'm going to send you an email in like two minutes. And then we'll work together uh, for, yeah, we'll, we'll work together. We'll set up like a Zoom call or something uh, because I know that some people want more creative uh, what do you call it, creative agency over what this might look like. So I don't want to impede you or impe impede that sort of creative process. Um, but thank you guys so much. I also want to thank Randy and Deanna for having me. This has been so much fun. And this is such a great way to kind of build on my experience sharing, especially the longboarding part through Design Week. So again, if you're interested in seeing that and how I made the 4.2 foot long long board, look at the Makerspace Instagram. And there's like a little feature from Design Week that I think was posted like last Thursday or the Thursday before. Uh, and you can see that process and also ask me any questions and reach out if you have any um, curiosities surrounding that. So thank you guys.